to the second part of this video about costing in food product development and I wanted to walk through some spreadsheet examples. So those of you who have had me in class before at Niagara College know that in some of your early classes we talk about doing um, recipe costing and that's where we're taking the cost of the different ingredients and we're breaking it down into cost per gram so that when we have our formulation we know what the cost of each recipe is going to be. And, and when it comes to food product development, we are using these same types of calculations to look at what our unit costs are going to be on the manufacture of our product. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to calculate costs of good manufactured, and you'll be able to tabulate fixed and variable costs in food manufacturing using spreadsheets, and we'll calculate some break even for costing and use that break-even analysis and sales forecasting. And oftentimes this is something that I talk to small business about. So they'll come in and they'll say, oh, you know what? I, I have this wonderful um, banana cream pie. I, you know, I like banana cream pie and I always talk about banana cream pie. And they're like, oh, I want to get into business. I want to open a shop and sell banana cream pie. And I'm like, fantastic. What, what's your current sales forecast? And I'm like, oh, well, 100 units. I'm like, so what's your break-even analysis? And they'll sit and scratch their head. And I'm like, so... If you're renting a building and you're paying for labor and you're paying for utilities and insurance and advertising and social media and you think you're going to sell 100 banana cream pies in a month, are you going to break even? Or what, what's the price point going to be on these pies? And they're scratching their head. Um, using some of these fixed cost calculators, you can start to make an uh, estimate how much do you need to sell to be able to be profitable within your business. So let's make something easy. I like pickled carrots and they're pretty easy because there's not a lot of ingredients. So let's jump out. Uh, pardon me, I'm just going to be our friends and I'm just not going to edit this out because again, at this point you have seen lots of my videos and some minor editing issues are inconsequential. So first off, I just, all of these numbers are arbitrary, so just a fair warning, I just pulled some numbers out of my head, but I wanted to give an example of what this might look like in terms of setting up some cost estimates for your product. So first off, I wanted to have my fixed costs. So I started up a running tally of all the different fixed costs that I might have. So let's say I'm renting out a building at 1500 and now I've got insurance, $400. I've got my GS1, so that's uh, getting my barcodes. I'm paying a $50 licensing for that. I'm paying out $100 for software. Maybe I've got ESHA and uh, Microsoft Office. And then I've got some salaries. And I, I, I'm I, going to do a couple different comparator um, spreadsheets here. So first off, I just, I just put everyone in as a salaried employee. So I've got myself in there. I'm paying myself $5,000 a month. And then I've got two salary workers working at approximately the equivalent of minimum wage, but they're in there at $3,000 a month. Now, the thing is, I've got employees, and I've, I have to remember that if I've got employees, I have to pay out employment insurance benefits and workers' compensation and so on. Again, these numbers are all arbitrary, and I do want to uh, tell people to work with a bookkeeper and... Um, employment specialist to know exactly what these employee benefits should be, but I wanted to just give you some numbers to show the impact of these numbers. Maybe I'm paying a part-time bookkeeper at $1,000 to uh, do accounts receivable and, and so on. Uh, maybe I've got line of credit payments, so maybe I took out a line of credit to buy my equipment and I've got to pay it down over several years, so I'm paying maybe $2,000 a month in line of credit. Um, Utilities, maybe I, I'm putting them as fixed costs here. So this is where it could be some fixed costs and some variable costs, because again, I mentioned this in the previous slideshow. Let's say I'm running an electric kettle. If I'm running that electric kettle and I'm only making a thousand units, I'm not going to use as much electricity as if I were making 10,000 units or a hundred thousand units. So again, I'm not a I'm not a finance or accounting specialist, but I wanted to give 
the product development students uh, a bit of a perspective on how this might be done. Again, I've got my utilities gas in there as a fixed cost, but it could be part fixed, part variable, or it could be all variable cost. Water is in there, garbage disposal, HACCP consultant, sanitation crew, social media. I haven't got line items in there for marketing or for snow removal or there's all sorts of different fixed costs that need to be accounted for and it's really important to be aware of all the sorts of costs that are out there and put that into your calculations. Now I've got my variable costs and I've done this out at uh, per 1000 units and I'm I'm pooling it thinking I'm going to consider 1000 units a day's work. We can make a thousand jars a day. So let's say I'm buying in a hundred dollars worth of carrots and I'm spending ten dollars worth of water and so on and so on. I've got all my ingredients here. Carrots, water, salt, and dill. Oops, I forgot the garlic. That's okay. Um, bear with me. But then I've also got my packaging costs. So I've got a jar. I've got a lid. I've got a label. Wait a second. I've got even ink. If I am using a jet inker and I'm putting on a best before date, I have to cost in my cost of ink for that inkjet for uh, labeling my labeling my product these little tiny costs start to eat into the um, cost of good manufactured and it's really important to be aware of them and make a appropriate estimate or actual cost on it I've got a secondary carton and a tertiary carton I've got some shrink wrap I've got some tape to close my boxes I've got a pallet and maybe I've got to print off some GTIN labels as well GTIN uh, labels are linked out to my GS1 barcodes. And so let's say for a thousand jars, it's going to cost me a thousand dollars and 53 cents. Hey, that's about, uh, in terms of my costs of goods, that was approximately what I wanted to have. Now, first off, I'm going to jump into what would happen if I switched off some of these different costs. Now, what I should have is a process flow diagram for making my carrots. So I'm, I'm receiving the carrots, I am inspecting the carrots, washing the carrots, peeling the carrots, cutting the carrots, loading them to the jar. And meanwhile, I've got a secondary uh, flow chart line where I'm mixing my brine and I'm putting the brine onto the jar. I am pasteurizing it and labeling it and out it goes. I haven't even put in my fixed cost microbiology or other things. What would happen? What would happen if I were to suddenly say, you know what, instead of paying to minimum wage salary workers, I'm going to instead get in hourly employees. And so let's say I need to make a thousand jars, but instead I've gotten rid of that employee line here and I put in hourly labor. So I, I'm assuming I've got two workers paid hourly and we're making a thousand jars. And as I mentioned before, I, I made the rough estimate in my head. It takes us one day to make a thousand jars. So I'm paying these guys, let's say $16 an hour times eight hours times two workers. And that changed my hourly labor cost. And now it's a variable cost. Now, what would happen if I were to suddenly change my ingredients and instead of having carrots that you have to peel and carrots that you have to chop, let's say we brought in baby pre-peeled carrots and my cost of ingredients went up, but my hourly labor decreased. And because my hourly labor decreased, my employee benefits decreased. So I don't have to pay as much um, EI and employment insurance and WSIB when I'm not paying for as much hourly labor. So from there, I did what was called a revenue projection. I, what I walked through, and if you take a look, I'm going to actually blow this up here. Let's jump out here to salaried employees and I'm going to blow up so you can see my calculation here. I went through and I said, well, what would happen if I sold $1,000 or 1,000 jars? That fixed cost is always going to be there, whether I sell a thousand jars or 20,000 jars. Now, I'm going to assume that we can still make 20,000 jars with the same amount of employees. 
But as soon as we hit a certain threshold, I'm going to have to start adding more employees. So I kept it to 20,000 as my max calculation. Once I hit that point, maybe I need to start adding more employees and that's going to start to impact on my cost of um, WSIB and employee benefits and salaries. But let's run it with this. So how did I get this calculation? What I did was I took, so we've got L4, I got that, and I figured out this is my cost per 1,000 jars. So L4 times IS, uh, I121, so the box down here, and I'm going to divide it by the number of jars so that I know this is my net revenue, and this is what, based off of this, I should be selling my jar for. My cost of good manufactured is $25.70 if I'm going to break even. <laughs> and you're going to laugh because no one's going to buy a jar of carrot pickles for $25, not even your mother. <laughs> the more I make based off of this salary projection, the more my price is going to drop. Now, I have to make the assumption here that this employee is sitting there twiddling their thumbs if we only sell a thousand jars a month. And so in reality, odds are we're going to find something else for this employee to do, or we are not going to hire these employees. We're going to go to an hourly employee instead. Let's see what happens if we jump over to an hourly employee. So just remember 2570 and we're going out to uh, 228 um, as our as our price point when we get to 20,000, sort of when we're getting the maximum manufacturing capacity. See what happens when we jump out to hourly employees. So now we're at $19 if we just make a thousand jars. Why? Because we've switched it over to hourly labor. And the cost, I realize these numbers are faked, but note how much faster we get down into a realistic price range when we switch over into hourly labor. Oftentimes I have this conversation because uh, many people know that I'm a big uh, union advocate and a big uh, fair workplace advocate. And the big challenge is that hourly labor versus salary labor, unless you have a really well-oiled machine and you have a lot of production going through and you are able to pivot an hourly or a salaried worker from one job role to another, Hourly labor is how much of the food industry works because you're able to drop your cost of goods because you're flexing that workforce. And if you need the workforce in, you bring them in. And if you don't need the workforce in, you don't bring them in. And that's going to consistently be part of the problem that we are building our food manufacturing industry on an hourly labor framework because the cost of goods as compared to a salary job is so much lower because we're flexing and we're able to get break even much faster because we have an hourly labor and we're flexing the number of uh, the number of work hours that are being done based off of the quantity of product that's being made. Hourly labor though doesn't attract people to the workforce and that's always going to be a problem. What would happen if I switched over to labor saving ingredients? Oh, we hit break even even faster and our product is much more competitive. Oftentimes when I'm working with our product development students, I often yell at them and say, jump to labor saving ingredients as fast as possible. So can you jump from fresh squeezed hand peeled mangoes to canned mango puree? Or can you go from hand peeling carrots to pre-peeled baby carrots fresh or IQF frozen diced carrots. Many of these labor saving um, attributes oftentimes have distinctive cost benefit in terms of hitting the cost of good per unit faster because you're not paying out for the labor. And this again, a lot of people know I'm a big labor advocate. This is always problematic for me to say, but where can you increase productivity and decrease labor cost because it's going to make your product more competitive? Now, I did uh, jump out and do what was a revenue projection. So let's say I had to sell that cost of goods 
at $2.50 to my distributor. If I am selling $2.50 to my distributor and I'm making 1,000 jars per month, based off of how much fixed costs I have, so I have to subtract, I have to subtract from my, uh, this is the, so $2.50 minus this cost, and then multiply it by the number of jars that I actually sold to my distributor. And in this case, I'm burning $16,000 a month if I'm just selling a thousand jars based off of this sort of rent and insurance structure. Now we could also make the argument, Hey, could, instead of, instead of renting a building on a monthly basis, could I rent a building on a daily basis and find a commercial kitchen with a daily rental rate? Um, insurance, you likely can't whittle down. If anything, insurance is going to be part fixed, part variable cost. GS1, you can't whittle down. Software, you can't whittle down. Salaries, at a certain point, you got to pay yourself and eat. But could this be a part-time job where you do it on a weekend or do it in the nighttime? Bookkeeping, you can start to do your own bookkeeping. Line of credit payment, if you need equipment, you need equipment. But can you rent it or can you buy it used? Utilities and so on, if you're doing a daily rental, sometimes those utilities are going to be bundled into your daily rental costs. So you're going to see a higher upfront daily rental. HACCP consultant. I can't stress this enough. If you are getting a HACCP consultant versus hiring a student who knows how to run a HACCP program, that's a lot of costs for, uh, let's say, one or two days on site per month. Sanitation crew. Could your own team be doing that sanitation? All sorts of different things that could be managed by your team to reduce cost. But what we did was that revenue projection. And depending on this, this current status, we're burning $16,000 a month if we're just selling a thousand jars. Now we can run those numbers up and we can figure out where our break even is. So what we, what we're noting here is when we're using labor saving ingredients, our break even where we're starting to be profitable is at approximately 16,000 jars. Where are we at when we're using hourly employees? Also about 16,000 jars, but not quite the same profit margin. And what happens if we're using salaried employees? We are pushing up into 18,000 jars. That said, we've got employees who are there who could be helping with marketing and helping with other types, types of activities. So what do these look like? I built out some graphs. Those of you who are taking this course at Niagara College, you can find these um, example graphs in the Blackboard and you can modify them for your own purposes. Um, but I did what a, a just a cost per jar versus jars made. And yeah, it does converge in as we're as we're honing in. It's worth going back to the original spreadsheet because these numbers up here inflate it so highly. But these revenue projections to find that break even, what I want to see is where is that zero point? And in the case of the zero point, we're hitting it fastest, lowest number of jars, around 15,000 jars when we're using labor saving ingredients and hourly workers. And so this is always top of mind because so many of the small artisans that I work with are saying, I want to use quality handcrafted ingredients. I want to hand chop things. I want to, I want to um, make sure that I'm paying everyone a uh, livable wage. And I'm like, that's brilliant. I love it. This is wonderful, except you got to drive your cost of goods down at the same time so that you hit break even. This is always going to be a conundrum in my mind. And this is why I think we need to educate and open up and show people all these numbers because then it gives us a sense of appreciation on the value of the food that we're eating. Anyways, those of you who are food product development students with me, have some fun with these. Um, I want you to do some break-even um, analyses and watch out for an assignment for this because you know I love you and I love to assess your skill uh, development on your projects. I look forward to your comments and I look forward to speaking with you again real soon. Take care.